The world of fungi is full of fantastic shapes and colors. And even if you study them all your life, every time you turn around you'll discover there are new species in your area. Ones that fill some little thought of but essential ecological niche. Or one that is haunting and dazzling in its color. And fungi do so much for us. They compost decaying organic matter, provide medicines and antibiotics, they can provide cloth and even leather substitutes, and like plants help to prevent erosion. And in the last few years, scientists have learned that fungal threads beneath the soil form symbiotic relationships with some 95% of the plants on Earth, exchanging nutrients for sugars and even carrying messages between trees so that they can communicate and plan their defenses against pathogens and look after one another when times are hard. I think mushrooms are among the most fascinating classes of organisms on Earth, and I've been studying them and teaching about them for much of my life. And since I get asked so many questions about what they do, and especially how are they identified, we're going to take some time to learn the principles of mushroom identification. This will not be a quick nor easy journey, but I can promise you it will be fascinating, as we discover little known and exotic forms such as these often overlooked bird's nest mushrooms, and encounter the ever eye-catching lion's mane, a delectable fungus which sometimes grows huge and is so beautiful it can be a shame to eat. We'll even discover fungi that grow like gelatin upon the nooks and crannies of decaying wood. But while the exotics are always eye-catching and tempting, we'll start off with the quintessential classic fungal form, the one which, if you ask most people, they would say is a mushroom. Scientifically, this particular mushroom is known as Amanita by Sporogera, and more commonly it is known as the Destroying Angel. And with good reason, this mushroom is absolutely deadly, but we'll use it for the moment because it offers the perfect form with which to begin our studies. This type of mushroom follows the classic cap and stem shape, and it also sports a couple important additional features, including color, or lack thereof, as well as skirts and bulbs. Fundamentally, cap and stem mushrooms can be broken into two to three parts. The cap at the top, properly known as a pileus, the stem beneath that, properly known as a stipe, and the bulb at the base of the stem, which emerges from the earth and is properly known as a vulva. Let's detour from mushroom identification for just a moment to talk about scientific nomenclature. Scientific names and nomenclature are more than just tricks that scientists use to sound fancy and erudite. Common names may be easier to remember, but their usage varies from place to place, and their meanings overlap. So in this video, I'm going to use scientific nomenclature. I will use the common name for a part of a mushroom or a species of mushroom, then provide the alternative scientific term. And though it might seem at first a nuisance to use scientific nomenclature, I cannot emphasize enough its importance. As your studies of fungi progress, whether you're a budding mycologist, a naturalist, or a forager, knowing these terms will save a great deal of confusion when speaking with other experts, and it's essential for consulting the better field guides, which for reasons of clarity typically stick with scientific nomenclature. This rather large fungus is known as the horse mushroom, or scientifically as Agaricus arvensis. Unlike the Amanita we saw a moment ago, it is not deadly. In fact, it's one of the best tasting mushrooms you can find. And as you can see, they grow quite large. The knife I have placed in the image for scale is about 8 inches long, which is about 20 centimeters, and it indicates that the cap itself is about 15 centimeters or 6 inches in diameter. Notice the gills on the underside of the cap. The scientific term for gills is lamellae. These are illustrative of the types of fungi we will be studying today. Cap and stemmed mushrooms with gills, or correctly, fungi with pileuses and stipes that also possess lamellae. The purpose of lamellae is to release the mushroom spores. Spores are like microscopic mushroom seeds, and we'll take a closer look at them later on. For now, suffice it to say that it is important to understand lamellae because their appearance and characteristics are key to identifying which type of gilled mushroom one is found. How the lamellae attach to the stipe, or not, is an important identification characteristic. Notice how, with Agaricus arvensis, the lamellae are completely detached from the stipe. This is known as a free gill, or free lamellae pattern. Rudimentary mushroom identification guides will typically describe gilled mushrooms as having free, semi-detached, or attached gills. More thorough guides will mention the full range of gill attachment types. They are shown in the proceeding chart. As you can see, when we become more precise, there are eight different gill types, and these fundamentally describe how the lamellae attach to the stipe. Attachments range from decurrent, where the lamellae run well down the stipe, all the way to free, where the lamellae do not attach to the stipe at all. 
I suggest, rather than trying to memorize all eight gill types at once, instead focus on identifying one particular mushroom, perhaps an edible or something whose appearance makes it of particular interest to you, and get to know that mushroom in and out, including its gill structure. Spend a while, even several weeks on that mushroom, and then bit by bit, one at a time, add a different mushroom with a different type of gill structure to the repertoire of those that you know. The color of gills is also an important identification feature. Amanitas, shown here, have much physiologically in common with agaricus fungi, and yet some of the deadliest organisms in the world are found among the Amanita genus. While there are no deadly agaricus, and indeed some of them are among the most prized edible mushrooms, gill color is one of the important distinguishing traits. Amanitas, by and large, have pale gills. Agaricus, by and large, have pinkish gills, which over time darken to a chocolate brown. Another identification trait relevant to gills, or lamellae, is how dense they are within the pileus. With this agaricus mushroom, one can see the lamellae are virtually packed into the space within the pileus. Yet under the pileus of this hygrocybe cochinia, one can see there is a great deal of space between the lamellae. There are four basic classifications referring to the space between the gills. Crowded, close, subdistant, and distant. Another important identification trait related to lamellae is to note that each lamella, or individual gill, does not always reach from the edge of the pileus to the stipe. Some fungi have only partial gills, or partial lamellae. In some field guides, these are referred to as plates and partial plates. This is actually fairly common among fungi, and when it occurs, it tends to occur in one of two patterns. There is the 4 to 1 pattern, where between each full gill, there is a partial gill, and to either side of that partial gill, can be found two diminutive partial gills. And there is also the two to one pattern, which goes full gill, partial gill, full gill, and so on. It should be noted also that there are many exceptions. Even on the same pileus, one may find both four to one and two to one patterns, as you can see when we return to a full scale perspective of this hygrocybe cochinia. And finally, sometimes gills will be forked at the ends, as you see here. Notice the tiny forking within the red circle. It's small, barely noticeable but it is there. There are other gill derivations. Some mushrooms, for example, have false gills. An example would be the much prized cantharellus, which is also known as the chanarelle. Its false gills also provide one of the best and clearest examples of forking. Study the gill-like structures, and you'll easily find them about halfway between the stipe and the lip of the pileus. And on other mushrooms, instead of gill-like structures in the hymenium, that's the fertile spore-bearing surface under the cap, we'll find what looks like wrinkles. We see this on the Turbinalis flacosis, previously known as the gomphus or woolly chanarelle, not a true chanarelle, but this is a mushroom type for another video. Gilda mushrooms have a cap, or pileus, which can come in a variety of shapes and sizes. In this image, we see a mushroom called the Rusula laroceraceae, a nondescript, almost generic cap and stem mushroom, which would not stand out at all except for its unique and particularly wonderful fragrance of maraschino cherries. But don't let that tempt you into eating it. It's not sweet, and its taste is quite acrid, and some sources even report that it has emetic properties. If we look at the top of a pileus of a Rusula laroceraceae, we can see it's pretty plain. This top is fairly aged and has some dark browning discoloration as it begins to rot. But notice along the edges of the pileus, the deeply grooved striations. This is an identification trait of the Rusula laroceraceae, aside from its distinct maraschino cherry fragrance. Notice also that the grooves run right down to the very edge of the pileus, forming something like teeth. Let's take a moment to talk about the shape of the pileus. As a mushroom first emerges and the pileus begins to form, it possesses an initial rounded or bullet shape, as shown here with this young Rusula emetica, a particularly noxious mushroom known commonly as the sickener, but with its bright reds and whites when it's young, looks particularly cheery. But as the pileus grows and develops, they often flatten out, which we can see happening here with this pair of Rusula rosea fungi. The pilei of some fungi will also develop a concavity toward the center as they flatten out, which you can see here where the concavity is so pronounced it's trapped some rainwater. But as they age and dry, many caps will continue to curl up so that toward the end of their lifespan, they can form a distinctive bowl-like shape. In the middle of their growth cycle, the pilei of some mushrooms will hold a distinctive and elegant convex shape, such as we see here in this hygrocybe cochinia, commonly known as the scarlet hood, Though the pilei of other fungi can be quite conical, 
even resembling the traditional rice farmer's hat. And notice the distinctive full plate, partial plate, two to one pattern of gills beneath the pileus, really standing out with this fungus, as its gills dip well below the lip of the cap. Of course, fungi possess other identifying features beyond the shape of the pileus. Many amanitas, for example, possess warts, which you can see here in this young and developing mushroom. The apparent warts on the amanita cap are leftovers from what is called a universal veil, which covered the entire mushroom early in its growth. As the mushroom grew, the veil fell away, but bits and pieces remained attached to the pileus. And the pilei of some fungi possess very subtle striations, almost as if an artist painted them on with a coarse brush, while the pilei of other fungi seem to hang down as if they were lampshades or skirts braced with frames. Time forbids us to go into the full range of variety of shapes, sizes, colors, smells, and phenomena such as bleeding that we may encounter in the pilei of mushrooms. But it is important to learn to be aware of and recognize these traits when they are encountered. Good field guides will describe them, and the more you practice, the better you will become at identifying them instantly. I've created this chart to conveniently indicate the nine basic shapes of mushroom caps, or pilei. All fungi reproduce by releasing spores, and spores play key roles in fungi identification, where, under a microscope, they can be examined for size, shape, and color and taken further, they can be genetically analyzed. But for the purposes of field identification, what we need to be concerned with is a simple spore print. Spore prints are easy to make. Simply take the pileus of a mushroom and place it, lamellae side down, on a flat surface, such as a piece of construction paper. If you believe the spores a mushroom will produce will be dark, use a white sheet. If you believe the spores will be light, use a dark sheet. You can also easily make a reusable mushroom spore print tool by taking a plate of glass, perhaps recycled from a window, cleaning it, and setting your mushroom caps on it, then you can just hold it over a dark or light surface to see the spore prints more clearly. I made my reusable spore print plate by recycling a small glass shelf from an old refrigerator. Over a period of time, as little as an hour in some cases, as much as 24 hours in others, the pilei will release their spores onto the plate. When enough of them have been released, you will be able to clearly make out the spore's color and spore colors provide important clues to the identification of a mushroom. Let's take a moment to talk about the stems, or stipes, of cap and stem mushrooms. As with all other visible parts of a mushroom, the shapes, colors, and structures found on stipes provide important clues to the identification of whatever fungus you are observing. Note the exceedingly long and delicately slender stipe beneath the pileus of this fungus, and compare and contrast with this one the robustness of a stipe is an important clue to a mushroom's identification. Also notes how this stipe has scale-like structures that face upward, as does this one. While ultimately this stipe is very smooth, textures that seem like fibrous structures, striations, scale-like structures and scabers, and mere points of discoloration called glandular dots are all important identification characteristics on the stipes of fungi. But also note the skirt, or annulus, just beneath the pileus. It is old, half dried out and collapsed, and at this point it could easily fall off, or rain can make it tacky and sticky so that it sticks so firmly to the stipe that it's almost invisible. On some species, skirts can be robust and durable, and on other species they can be iffy and somewhat ephemeral, easily drying off and falling away. And on some species, if the annulus does fall away, the evidence there ever was an annulus is almost invisible while on other species, when the annulus falls away, it leaves a scar. Many species of fungi do not have skirts at all, or they may have had skirts which fell away and thus are no longer visible. This is one of my favorite images showing a skirt falling away from a rusula in action. The annulus is entirely detached from the stipe and is slipping downward as the wind shakes the mushroom. Or they might possess skirts, but when they're very young, the skirt has not yet separated from the cap. Instead, it can hide the lamellae and conceal its presence, potentially leading to a serious misidentification of a fungus. If in doubt, pick away at the base of the pileus. If there is a veil, it is easily revealed, and you'll quickly expose whatever is underneath. But typically, nature will biodegrade away a veil pretty quickly, as shown here. One final point to note is that some stipes are hollow, which we can see here in this cross-section of the base of the stipe of Hygrocybe cochinia. As with all things mushroom, 
There are many, many other variations to be found in stipes, including color changes with bruising and cutting, seeping of a sap or milk-like substance, and differing stipe shapes, such as stubby stipes, robust stipes, and thin, tall, and graceful stipes. Always pay attention to your field guide's descriptions, and remember that even within the same species, the form of a mushroom can vary. A fairly young mushroom can look quite different from a median age mushroom and different still from an old mushroom. Now let's study the bases of stipes. This includes the vulva from which amanitas emerge and whatever form the base of any other mushroom might take. The bases of the stipes themselves can enlarge to bulb-like shapes or they might maintain fairly consistent dimensions with the rest of the stipe. And beneath some stipes, one will find threads, sometimes in thick bundles, that seem to run into the earth and disappear. Those threads are actually the mushroom, or what should rather be described as the real fungus underneath. For the mushroom itself is only that fungus's fruiting body. And whether or not you find such mycelial threads or masses beneath the stipe can also be an identifying characteristic. These lovely salmon orange fungi are Entoloma quadratum, which I recently found in an old growth forest of hemlocks. Notice the off white, somewhat amorphous mass at the base of these stipes. That is the underground mycelia of this fungus coming to the surface to form the fruiting bodies. The mushrooms we know as Entoloma quadratum. However, one does not always see this, and it is not noted in field guides that I am aware of as an identification characteristic. With many mushrooms, when you pull them up from the growth medium, you will find only a rounded or conical base at the stipe. You will rarely, if ever, see any mycelial threads attached to the stipe, and that probably has a lot to do with they're simply too small and fragile to hang on when the mushroom itself is harvested. Always check your field guides, though, because some mushroom bases have more robust mycelial connections than others. And when this happens, it can become an identification trait. But of all the various stipe based types, that which demarcates the Amanita genus is the most important and the most critical, because many Amanitas are deadly poisonous. And while, as a rule, Amanitas are not too difficult to identify without knowing how, they can easily be confused with many gilled edible mushrooms. All Amanitas grow from a universal veil. This veil appears in the ground like an egg or a little puffball. And as the Amanita develops, it will take initial form within this egg and then burst out of its veil. The universal veil then takes on the cup-like form that is distinctive of some Amanitas. But not all Amanitas create that cup-like formation at the base. Many seem to emerge from a bulb, and you may find scars of the universal veil along the base, or evidence of its previous existence on top of the pileus where it can appear like warts. These are particularly visible on colorful Amanita muscaria mushrooms as well as their cousins. This video should provide you with the fundamentals for identifying gilled mushrooms. Of course, there is very much more to learn. I've been studying mushrooms much of my life, and every time I go out into the woods or meadows to observe them, I find new things that I've never seen before. This should come as no surprise since it is estimated there are 5 million or more species of mushrooms in the world, many of which have never yet even been catalogued or described. The points we've gone over in this video are related to field identification. One can become more precise by bringing mushrooms into the home and making things such as spore prints as we described earlier or even investing in a microscope and learning how to measure spores, colors, shapes, and sizes. But no matter how far you take your skills in the world of mushroom observation and identification, prepare to always be surprised. Mushrooms will never cease to amaze you with their striking variety of shapes and colors, their massive or minuscule sizes, and as you get deeper into studying them, their uncanny intelligence and the way these ancient organisms have interwoven so much of the life we find here in the world. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.